We begin this morning with the death this past week at the age of 95 of the Cork historian John A. Murphy, who, as the RTE Sound Archives attest, had opinions on most subjects, including traditional music, about which he had this to say in a programme on 70 years of local radio coming from the Cork station. But at any rate, the number of people now playing instrumental music is greater than it ever had been in Ireland, and I think that is due in large measure to radio. He was quintessentially a Corkman, although he allowed that his own roots in McCroom brought him closer to what he termed the subculture of the West Cork Kerry borderlands. I, I once said to a man in Killardon, you know, McCroom and Killardon belonged to the same subculture, and he was very cross because he thought subculture was something inferior. McCroom is different because it's on the borders of West Cork and there's a different kind of personality, nearer to Kerry, actually. So when you talk about Cork, really, you're talking about the city. This is from an interview with David Handley from Handley's People on RTE television. I think one reason why there is a distinct feeling of being uh, from Cork and, and that it means something different is that other people think it means something different. So it is a mere perception, then? Well, it's a perception on behalf of other people. If I were from Waterford or Leitrim, maybe, without casting any aspersions in those two grand counties, I doubt if people would all be saying to me every time they meet me, you know, what's going on in Cork with that kind of half jesting and uh, um, half putting me in my place kind of thing. Seriously, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the self-contained nature of the city, and the fact that it's, it's well away from Dublin, that it is, I suppose, it used to be anyway, what could be considered the ideal size, and it has a very human scale, and it has enough facilities, sporting and culture and everything else, uh, to make people feel that they don't have to compare themselves with Dublin. That's, that's very uh, important, I think. Here he is on the occasion of a live broadcast, celebrating 70 years of radio broadcasting from the Cork studios. By the way, I, I should <laughs> make a gloss on your description of me as an outsider. Uh, there's another sense in which I'm an outsider. I, I'm a native of McCroom. Um, yeah. Neil Tobin once said that people in the county are not, they're not really, they haven't achieved the plenitude of Corkiness, you know, <laughs> and he described them as carrymen with shoes. Again, to quote Neil Tobin, he talked about Cork people being so nostalgic. In fact, the city lends itself to nostalgia. This area where we are on Sunday as well is a kind of a genteel, crumbling grandeur about it. And his comment was that Cork people are the only tribe in the face of the earth who are homesick even when they are at home. <laughs> <laughs> so what of his McCroom roots? What did all that mean to him? Well, for me, the, it's the consciousness, I suppose, of belonging to uh, a family and to ancestors that have been rooted in that area as far back as I could go. So I, I think that feeling of being absolutely rooted in, in a particular area. Uh, my family, my mother and father, were both very strong nationalists. What were they? What was your father? My father was a carpenter, and he came from a, a long fam family of carpenters and small farmers. Later on, he ran a pub. He was in the Volunteers, and uh, she was in Gaelic League, Common Amon. I don't think they were ever involved, actually, in activism, uh, but, but the whole atmosphere I was growing up was very strongly nationalist, and, of course, they were uh, fanatical de Valera followers. Were you comfortable? Mm, frugal. Um, I, I wrote an article about that once uh, connected with my mother's musical influence on me. Paul Durkin actually ran a, a magazine called The Cock Review and uh, he persuaded me to write a thing called The Piano and McCroom. And uh, I described some of our circumstances in that. We were growing up in the, I suppose, late 1930s, I was certainly very conscious that we were better off than a whole lot of other people in my native town. There was the, the poverty there at many levels was appalling. In fact, the contrast between wealth and poverty was appalling. And you got to university. Were you interested in history at school? Was that your main interest? Yes, history and classics. I suppose interested in humanities. If, if, I, had, if I had had Greek in school, I might well have done a degree in classics in, instead of a degree in history. But did your parents uh, influence you in your is interest in history? Yeah, well, well, the nationalism thing was inescapable from history. In fact, for quite some time, it, it took me a long time to discover that, that history was a, a discipline in its own right and, and not simply an expression of nationalism. But undoubtedly, it was the nationalist um, upbringing that whetted my interest in history. And what do you think, in retrospect, of the way in which history was taught to you and everybody else? Well. It was taught, of course, along very simplistic lines. Was it a bad thing? I think it depended on the teacher, even more than the, uh, than the textbook. I, I, I'm aware there were terrible textbooks. 
unbelievably rabidly nationalist textbooks. And of course there were rabidly nationalist teachers who instilled hatred. And there are still some people in this country who are Anglophobes, who hate England, and indeed whose, whose main, main spring is, is hatred of England. Some of them are in very high places. But by and large, I can't, in my experience, and I came from, I suppose, what would be a fairly typical country town school, I can't recall any great malignancy, if you like, in the presentation of Irish history. From an interview with David Handley. In Seamus Hosey's series, Speaking Volumes, John A. Murphy was visited in among his books in his study in UCC, and among the books noticed by Seamus Hosey was Joe Lee's history, Ireland, 1912 to 1985, Politics and Society. A, a fellow historian and colleague yeah. of yours? Yes, and, and the connection is closer than that, really, in that um, my own Ireland in the 20th century was published in 1975, I think, covering roughly the same period. Mine was much slimmer, indeed, and I suppose I envy Joe Lee's uh, ability to... to to write in the same area at, at such great length. Joel, you would want to watch the tendency to regard him as a guru, really. Everywhere you see him quoted, it's some comment on contemporary Irish society. And that's understandable in a way because you get the impression from this book that he's somewhat in a hurry to get to the final extended sermon at the end of the book, you know, which everyone always dips into. But in fact, um, uh, the, 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 the great body of the book is, is history, is 20th century history. And uh, it's br brilliantly written. And, and again, it's a book into which I would constantly dip uh, for, for that reason. Another book which caught Seamus Hosey's attention was an old favourite, Deneen's Dictionary. And I, I'm not sure what you can pick it up for now, or whether it's available from government publications. Uh, but the time that... My wife gave me a copy of this, 1971. I remember it was for a, a couple of shillings, literally. Uh, what I like about it is, is it's in the Clo I mean, the, the Irish words are in the Irish print. And uh, we become so used to the, to the Clo Rovanach that really um, we, we forget how lovely the, the Gaelic script is. So I, I like that appearance of it. But above all, it's the rather eccentric but very learned content of the book that fascinates me. You, you remember Miles McGoplin used to make great fun of Deneen, um, allegedly quoting definitions, which the one word he claimed was often uh, defined by Deneen to mean a rare disease in sheep and um, a loud sound made in an empty house by an unauthorised person. You know? <laughs> and mind you, that's close enough to the actual reality. But there's always something to intrigue, and it's like... The Virgilian lot is like opening at random, you find a little gem. For example, even yesterday I came across this, a word called Kivirsha, which I never heard of before, and it means friendship and camaraderie and reconciliation. And then he says, Tour dum Kivirsha is cur peeper daragam live. Give me your friendship and put a lighted pipe in my hand. And then he goes on, To smoke the same pipe was a sign of friendliness. The custom was widespread and flourished even in Irish regiments in the British Army. So the, that, that kind of um, uh, information offered in this casual fashion is, is part of the attraction of, of that great book. And since we're on dictionaries, we will conclude on John A. Murphy with a question from the David Hanley interview, where he asked John A. Murphy to consider the misunderstandings in the debate about revisionism in the writing of Irish history? Well, it's one of these words, it is amusing to note, that is now becoming a term of abuse. I was called a revisionist so-and-so not so long ago in a Cork pub by someone who, I, from the look of him, I'd say didn't know what it meant. It's, it's used by people like Sinn Féin, for example, as a term of abuse to those who don't accept the eight centuries of conquest view of Irish history. I heard one such speaker not so long ago at a commemoration warning historians not to tamper with our history uh, as if it is a, a sacred text which mustn't be touched. And this whole idea of history as a fixed body of truths and of nationalist truths at that um, is, is behind all that idea. Now, history of course isn't a bit like that. It's a constantly changing landscape. Uh, we try to recover what we know of the past. Every so often we get new insights, we get new material and we reshape the landscape accordingly. And that's the best we can do. That's the essence of the humane exercise of, of, of the historian. So that all historians are revisionists, in fact. 
And what is called revisionism frequently is no more than a job being done for the first time properly. Up to now you had mythology, you do your best to replace it with, with what emerges from the facts, and that's history. Um, so the word is, is, is wrongly used, as it were. And I think people who talk about revisionism still believe that history is part of Irish nationalism. They're interchangeable. Um, it's a kind of a nationalist sacrilege to touch history, their view of history. So um, I think people are not clear on that, um, that revisionism, in fact, is the work which historians have to do all the time. The former senator and UCC historian John A. Murphy, who died last week, and that's but a fraction of the material to be found in the RTE Sound Archives. As a public intellectual, John A. Murphy was a welcome guest in many radio and television studios and a welcome guest to listeners and viewers as well, and even to those who disagreed with them, had a great respect for his forthright opinions.